solar storms, and disaster plans. On a March night 21 years ago, a storm brought Quebec's electric power grid to its knees. It wasn't snow, ice, or wind that caused Hydro-Quebec's high-voltage transmission system to go down, blacking out millions of customers for nine hours or more. It was a solar storm, a blast of electrically charged gas from the sun that disrupted the Earth's magnetic field and made the grid go haywire. As bad as this space weather was, it even damaged a giant transformer at a nuclear power plant in New Jersey, hundreds of miles from Quebec. Scientists and engineers say much more severe storms have occurred in the past, before the development of high voltage power grids, and are very possible in the future. Some say there might be one in 2012. In a worst case scenario, a major geomagnetic storm could be perhaps the largest natural disaster this country could face, said a consultant to the power industry. It could cause region-wide or larger blackouts potentially for months and affect grids on other continents as well. While the electric power industry learned much from the 1989 disturbance, and Hydro, Quebec and other utilities took steps to be better able to cope with such events, experts say that no grid anywhere is fully protected from a severe geomagnetic storm. It is difficult even to assess the risks of such events, which are very rare and potentially catastrophic. The concern for a utility is for these high impact, low probability events, said a technical executive with the Electric Power Research Institute. Mitigation becomes challenging. What's more, while the power industry has spent billions of dollars to harden systems against hurricanes, blizzards, and other Earth-based storms. From the standpoint of space weather, we could argue that we have just not understood the threat. While grids and higher latitudes are especially vulnerable, the growth of the transmission network in the United States, which now includes approximately 200,000 miles of high voltage lines, has increased the risk that a severe storm here will cause crippling severe damage. The larger you make the grid, the larger it acts like an antenna to disturbances in the Earth's magnetic field. Higher transmission voltages, favored by utilities because they result in lower energy losses, have also made grids more susceptible to damage from solar storms, said Sean Eagleton, a section manager for engineering with Con Edison, the New York area utility company. Engineers are involved in trade-offs, he said. In the process of making the system more efficient, they make it more vulnerable. But given the social and economic havoc or chaos that a blackout of months could wreck, engineers and scientists are starting to look more closely at the threat from a severe geomagnetic storm. Efforts are underway to improve forecasting, to give utilities more precise information about when and where a solar storm will hit and how severe the impact will be, so that grid operators can take defensive measures and utilities and researchers are working to devise equipment and procedures to better enable transmission systems to ride out a major event. Economics are a big issue also, and the cost of retrofitting hundreds or thousands of high voltage transformers, for example, would need to be analyzed. The end goal is to have a risk assessment and a mitigation methodology. It's a complex issue. It's not like many of the risks that utilities deal with. A geomagnetic storm begins with an enormous burst of electrically charged gas or plasma from the sun. The gas travels very quickly on the order of a million miles an hour or faster and if it happens to be aimed at Earth can reach the planet in as little as a day. Then very strange things happen to the Earth's orderly magnetic field. It begins to fluctuate creating differing electrical potentials on the Earth's surface. From this point, a simple law of electricity follows. 
at the potential at one end of a transmission line is higher than the potential at the other end. Dozens or even hundreds of miles away, a current will flow through the line. It is these currents that can cause problems. They are so different from the normal currents and high voltage lines that they interfere with the operation of the transformers, the voltage boosters or reducers that are an essential part of the grid. Transformers can overheat and become damaged or develop other problems that can cause switches within the system to trip automatically. Voltage throughout the grid can begin to drop and unless more power can be quickly brought online either by starting up more generators or shunting it from another system the grid can collapse. That's what happened in Quebec in 1989 and it took only 92 seconds. Fortunately, most of the transformers were not permanently affected, but in a much more severe storm, similar to one that occurred in 1859, when other than telegraphs there was very little electrical equipment to be damaged. Transformers may be destroyed, become otherwise inoperable. These are not off-the-shelf products. A typical high-voltage transformer can weigh several hundred tons and is designed and built at a cost of up to $10 million or more for a particular installation, so it could take months to replace them. That's why scientists and others are working on ways to keep geomagnetically induced currents out of transmission lines to begin with. A device called a capacitor could be installed near each vulnerable transformer to effectively block currents from entering the transmission lines. Capacitors are usually fairly small. The ones on the circuit board inside a typical radio are usually smaller than a fingertip. But in transmission systems, the equipment would be roughly the size of a washing machine. and The capacitors would need to be able to be bypassed in a fraction of a second to allow conventional currents through. That makes for an active device, one that looks at what current is flowing and makes decisions in real time. That's a lot more expensive than a passive device. In the United States alone, approximately 5,000 vulnerable transformers would have to be retrofitted at a cost of perhaps $100,000 each plus installation. So, it would make little sense to retrofit only a few transformers. The rogue currents created by an extreme solar storm could flow here and there throughout the grid, damaging unprotected equipment. No one is really certain, however, how a redesigned or retrofitted transformer will perform in a severe storm. Unfortunately, the only way to know is to experience it. But more thorough research can help. If we had a very, very large storm, would the entire grid collapse? The answer is, we really don't know, because we don't have a very accurate, complete network analysis, and that is something that's very desirable. More immediate and less costly help can come in the form of better forecasting. At NASA's Goddard Space Flight Center in Greenbelt, Maryland, researchers are working to do that, running data from sun-sensing satellites and simulations that are more and more sophisticated. The project called Solar Shield is still experimental, but as the models are refined, it should become fully operational within the next few years, hopefully in time. With it, we could calculate exactly when this thing is going to happen and exactly what is going to happen. Extremely precise information about a storm that is about to hit would supposedly give grid operators time to take measures to add redundancy to their systems, like putting transmission lines that have been shut down for maintenance back in line, or preparing idle generators to start up again. Of course, this is all theoretical. And again, all these are more signs, more signs of the times, the end times, transition days, and the transition is a process. In other words, Everything that's not right must change quickly or rapidly. And for the better. Revelation.
Chapter 8, verse 12. And the fourth angel sounded, and the third part of the sun was smitten, and the third part of the moon, and the third part of the stars, so as the third part of them was darkened, and the day shone not for a third part of it, and the night likewise. 13. And I beheld and heard an angel flying through the mist of heaven, saying with a loud voice, Woe, woe, woe to the inhabitants of the earth by reason of the other voices of the trumpet of the three angels, which are yet to sound. Revelation chapter 10, verse 4. And when the seven thunders had uttered their voices, I was about to write, and I heard a voice from heaven saying unto me, Seal up those things which the seven thunders uttered, and write them not. 5. The angel which I saw stand upon the sea and upon the earth, lifted up his hand to heaven. 6. And swore by him that lives for ever and ever, who created heaven and the things that therein are, and the earth and the things that therein are, and the sea and the things which are therein, that there should be time no longer. 7. But in the days of the voice of the seventh angel, when he shall begin to sound, the mystery of God should be finished, as he has declared to his servants the prophets. Revelation chapter 16 verse 8 And the fourth angel poured out his vial upon the sun, and power was given unto him to scorch humans with fire. 9 And humans were scorched with great heat, and blasphemed the name of God, which has power over these plagues, and they repented not to give him glory. And there are many different types of signs happening day by day all around the world.